right, so when we talk about linear functions, right, we already know that y is equal to f of x. So we have worked um, a great deal with linear equations. So something like y equals 3x plus 2, we found the slope, we've created xy charts, we've created equations of lines, we've graphed them. I mean, everything that is imaginable with linear equations we've done. So if y equals f of x, if you just replace y with f of x, it magically becomes a linear function. And everything that we already know to be true about linear equations will also be true about linear functions. So they go through in section 4.1 and they review all of those things that we've already done. We've already been tested on that. So if you want to go back and review some of that content, you can, but that's all that we're going to talk about together from section 4.1. In section 4.2, we want to apply those linear functions, all right? So in 4.2, we're talking about using a linear model. Now, a model is just an example of a real world situation. That's all that it is, okay? So for this one, it says a town's population has been growing linearly. So that's important because they've told us this is a linear equation. In 2004, the population was 6,200. By 2009, the population had grown to 8,100. Assume that this trend continues. So the first thing it says is create a linear equation to model this information. What do you need to create the equation of a line? A slope. A slope and how, what do you need to get a slope? Two points. Two points. So if I'm going to create the equation of this line, I need two points. So let's think about x and y. We've talked about before that you don't always have an X and a Y. Like for us in this problem, we have population and years, not X's and Y's. So I need to think about what's the independent and what's the dependent. So does the population depend on what year it is or does what year it is depend on the population? Well, we don't get to time travel. We've talked about that before that we don't determine the calendar, that the population is going to depend on the year. So, if the population depends on the year, the population is dependent and the year is independent. So, that's how we can write our ordered pairs. So, if we come back up to this in 2004, the population was 6,200, how could we write that as an ordered pair? What's the year? 2004. What's the population? 6,200, right. So that's how we can pull an ordered pair out of the information that they give us. And then, of course, we could say in 2009, the population was 8,100. Okay, now I have two points. I can find my slope. So remember that slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I'm going to um, look at this um, 2009, 8,100. I'm going to look at that as my second point. So I'm going to say y2 minus y1, 8,100 minus 6,200, over x2 minus x1, 2009 minus 2004. Now, we already um, got our calculators out because we're going to use them a great deal in just a few moments. So go ahead and throw that into your calculator. We don't need to do that kind of computation by hand. Go ahead and throw that into your calculator and see what you get for your slope. You coming up with 380? Yes? All right. So what is that 380? It is a rate of change, yes. So in chapter three, another name for slope was average rate of change. It had the exact same formula and everything. So sometimes in WebAssign, instead of telling you your slope is 380, they'll say your rate of change is 380. So make sure that you recognize that either way. 
what does that mean that I have an average rate of change of 380? Well, if you go back and look at this, the 1900 is the change in Y or the change in the population and five is the change in X or in the year. So basically we're saying the population went up 1900 over the course of five years. When I reduce that down to 380 over one, I'm saying the population went up 380 over the course of one year, all right? So that is my rate of change. It is just how fast the population is increasing with respect to time. All right, so now let's create the equation in the line. You can use slope-intercept form or point-slope form. I'm going to use slope-intercept for this one, and then I'll use point-slope for the next one so that we kind of have an example of each. All right, so... Um, you can use either point that you want to. I'm going to use the one with smaller numbers. So I'm going to use 2004, 6,200. All right. So for Y, I'm going to put in 6,200. For M, I'm going to put in that 380 that we just calculated. For X, I'm going to put in 2004. All right. So now let's use that to solve for B. So again, we can do that in our calculator. So what would we do to solve for B? All right, multiply 380 and 2004, and that gives us 761,520. Then what? All right, so we're going to divide 6,200 by that 706, or not divide, I'm sorry, we're going to subtract um, 70, 761,520 from the 6,200. And that'll give us a negative 755,300 for B. What is B again? Y-intercept. We get a Y-intercept when X is equal to zero, right? So basically we're saying, what was Y? Was it the year or the population? Population. Can you have a population of a negative 755,000 people? Yes. Like, basically that same when we started, when, you know, when my time is equal to zero and we started, there were a negative 755,000. So there are obviously going to have to be some domain and range restrictions here, right? Like, you know, just to make sure that the information makes sense. But for our setting, just from 2004 to 2009, um, you can see that that equation would fit the information. All right, so what is that equation? All right, we're going to do Y equals M. What was M? 380. And then B was the negative 755,320 that we just got. So there is our equation. So then for B, it says use that equation that you just created. Use that equation to predict the population in 2025. All right, is population X or Y? So population is Y, right? And 2025 is what? Is that X or Y? X. So what am I going to do with the 2025? Plug it in for X, yeah. And when I plug it in for X, then I'll use it to find Y. All right, so again, we're definitely using our calculator for that computation. So if we put 2025 in for X, Multiply it by 380, subtract the 755,320, we'll end up with 14,180. Now, um, a lot of you are taking um, standardized tests next week, um, PSAT, SAT. Um, and so something that's a really useful tool on those kinds of assessments is the idea of estimation when you go to check your answer. Sometimes um, you'll read a problem and you may not know how to do it, but you can look at the answers and you can rule some of them out just because they don't make sense. And you can narrow your choices down by estimation as well. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about, all right? So if we look at this answer that we just got right here, this 14,000, all right? 2025, the last time that we took this data was in 2009, and then this is 2025, so that's 16 years later. 15 would be an easier number to work with, right? So I'm going to use 15 just as an approximation, as an estimate. 
Also, the population, we said, increased 380 every year. I'm going to round that off to 400 just to have an easier number to work with. So, if you take 400 times 15, you're going to get 6,000. So, if it was 8,100 and you add 6,000 to that, and now it's 14,180, that makes perfect sense. So, it's an easy way to check my answer to make sure it's logical to eliminate some answer choices that might not make sense. So, just a um, quick way to make sure that our answer looks good. All right. So, then C says, identify the year in which the population will reach 15,000. What's 15,000, X or Y? Y, so in this case, we're gonna put 15,000 in for Y, and we're gonna find X. Because X is the year, it says identify the year in which the population equaled this, all right? So if I'm gonna solve that equation for the year, if I'm gonna solve that equation for X, what would you do first? Yeah, add the 755,320. And then we could divide both sides by 380. And I get 2,027.158. What does that 0.158 mean? Yeah, I mean, we're just a little ways into 2027, right? So it says during what year did this happen? It happened during 2027. We're just a little bit into that year. All right, then the last two things they give us are domain and range, all right? So for the domain, normally we would say your domain is going to be all real numbers unless you have a zero in the denominator or a negative under an even indexed radical. And of course, if we look at this equation that um, we've created right here, there is no fraction and there is no radical. So we might be tempted to think all real numbers. You know, it's a line. Wouldn't the domain and range automatically be all real numbers? Well, we kind of got a glimpse into that a little bit ago when we talked about the y-intercept and we said that you can't have a negative 755,000 people, right? So that there might be some real world stipulations and that will be true in models. When you're working with word problems or with models, your domain and range will not follow those normal rules because they're going to be restricted by the situation you're working with, right? Let's say the situation you're working with involves area or volume or circumference or perimeter or something like that. What restriction is there going to be on that? What can those things be and not be? They can't be negative, right? You can't have a negative five feet, right? So there will be restrictions based on the situation that we're in. So for us in this problem, the only information that we were given was the first two ordered pairs that we started with. So our domain is going to go from 2004 to 2009. And our range is going to go from 6,200 to 8,100. And of course, we were equal to those values. So we're going to use brackets instead of parentheses in our interval notation. So our domain would be 2004 to 2009 and our range would be 6,200 to 8,100. All right, so that is section 4.2. Section 4.3 is not required by our syllabus, but section 4.3 shows you how to do the word problems on your calculator, and I kind of thought you might like to know that. So I'm going to go ahead and show you um, how we could do these same things that we were doing today, how we could do those on our calculator. Now, for this one problem, the thing that made it, I don't know, more challenging or confusing was just the huge numbers, right? And so sometimes what they'll do to make that easier to work with is they'll say something like, let um, t equals zero represent the years after 2000. So if that's the case, then I could write 2004 as just 4. And I could write 2009 as just 9. Um, other times they might say something like, you know, the population expressed in thousands. 
And in that case, I could use 6.2 and 8.1. So I would get to use smaller numbers. So whatever they give me, I'm still just going to write two ordered pairs. I'm going to find my slope. I'm going to create the equation of my line. All right. So look at the next example. It says the data in this table shows the number of people P in millions. Aren't you glad that they didn't write 120 million, 122 million? 100? Those would be fun numbers to work with, right? So again, they're using that abbreviation we were just talking about. And then it says, um, this is the US labor force from 1987 to 1997. And in the table, T equals seven corresponds to 1987. So basically T is the number of years after 1980. So seven is 1987, and eight is 1988, and nine is 1989, and we get the idea, okay? So I want to um, put these in my calculator and show you how you can do everything that we were just doing by hand. I wanna show you how we can do these on our calculator. Now, if I were drawing this out by hand, what values would I be putting on the x-axis? Like, what values did I need? So, yeah, I'd be putting the year. So, the year was 7 to 17, right? So, in that case, I would probably start with counting by ones to go from 7 to 17. Now, you'll notice this little squiggle right here. This is my origin 0, 0. That little squiggle right there gives me the right to skip from zero to seven. So I'm gonna start with seven and I'm gonna count by ones. If we don't put anything else on there, we assume that we're counting by ones. But I don't wanna do that on the y-axis, right? On the vertical axis, what values do we need to use? It was like 120 to 136 or something like that. I definitely don't wanna count by ones, maybe count by twos. Even counting by twos, I don't want to have to start over here and go two, four, six, eight, ten, all the way up to 120, right? So again, you'll notice that little squiggle is going to give us the right to skip from the origin to 120. And then if you're not going to count by ones, if you're going to count by something else, be sure to indicate what that is. So we indicated there that we're counting by twos. All right, so if we plotted those points that they just gave us, this is what we would get. All right, what does that look like? What kind of an equation does that look like it would fit? A linear equation, yeah, I could draw a line through there, right? So on the first example that we did, they told us this is a linear equation, this works linearly. If they don't tell me that, the way that I can tell is just by plotting the points, okay? So if they do tell you that it's linear, you don't need to plot the points. You already know that, okay? All right, so now that I know it's linear, I want to create the equation of the line. So I'm gonna pick two points. I picked the first one and the last one, and I'm gonna find my slope, all right? So I'm gonna do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, and I'm gonna get a slope of eight fifths. All right, now last time I used slope intercept form, this time I'm going to use point-slope form. So remember that point-slope is y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. So pick either point. I picked the smaller one, 7, 120. So I'm putting 120 in for y and 7 in for x. And then there's that 8 fifths that we just got over here for our slope. Okay? So that would be an equation of that line. What is the only problem with that equation? There actually might be many problems, but what is one problem with that equation? Every point goes through. Yeah, not every point goes through that. As a matter of fact, it's only guaranteed to go through two points, right? Like the first one and the last one. So you know how they're doing the census right now? And that thing is costing billions of dollars, right? I mean, it's important. They need to get a, an idea of the population because that's how they allocate funding in part from the federal government. So basically, I just told them that all that money that they spent collecting that information for all those other years, yeah, it was just a waste because I only used the first one and the last one. I didn't need any of the rest of them, right? Or let's say that, you know, of course, we're a military town. So let's say that there was a big deployment during one of those two years. 
So maybe that last year, we checked the first one and the last one, and that last year there was a big deployment, so our population was way down. And so then it looks like we don't have as many as much growth as we do. That messes up all the planning that they're doing for the future. That messes up the funding that we get for the enhancements that we need, right? I mean, so there are all kinds of issues and implications with this. So we really need to consider all those points. Okay, great. You want me to go through and like create an equation for every two combination of points? Can you imagine what that would be like? Like, you know, create a combination for the first two and the first one and the third one and the first one and the fourth one and the first one and the fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth. And then go back and do that for the second one and the third one. I'm going to have like 50 different equations then to average together. Like that's crazy. I can't do that. No, but my calculator can create an equation that fits all of those points and it can do it like that. It is called a regression. All right. So let's go back and let's look at how we can do all of these things that we have done thus far today on our calculator. So grab your graphing calculator, if you would, please. All right, now remember that anytime I touch a button on my calculator, it is going to light up in red. So I am going to um, go to statistics. And you can see it there lit up in red. I'm going to go to statistics and I'm going to go to edit. And I'm going to put that data from our table in list one and list two. Now, it's a really good idea to get into the practice of clearing your list before you start. So there's a fast, easy way to do that. See how I've got my cursor right up there on top of, oh, just kidding. Let me go back. I bumped something. See how I've got my cursor right there on top of list one? If I'll hit clear, enter, it'll clear that whole list at one time. That's a really important thing to do before you start a problem is to clear out anything that's already in there so that that way it doesn't skew your information because you might forget there are some values down below that you don't see and then that would mess everything up, right? Okay, so let's go ahead. And we're going to put the years in list one, and we're going to put the population in list two. So go ahead and do that, if you would, please. And when you're done, it's a really good idea to go back and check those, because if by chance you typed one of them in wrong, then it'll skew everything else. All right, so we put that information into statistics. If I want my calculator to plot those statistics, look right above y equals. Right above y equals, it says stat plot in the same color as your second button. So if I hit second and then y equals, I get my stat plot menu. So again, we put that in statistics. I want to go plot those now. So we're going to use stat plot right above y equals. So second y equals. All right, I'm going to choose that first plot and I'm going to turn it on. And then I'm going to tell it to do a scatter plot. You can see it could do all kinds of things, but we just want to plot points. I'm going to tell it to use list one and list two for X and Y. It should do that by default, but if it doesn't, you could tell it whatever you want or if you wanted to change that. And then down here, you can decide if you want blocks or plus signs or dots or smaller dots and what color you want and all that kind of thing. Okay. So to graph this, I need to set my window for what I want to see, all right? So we can set the window by hand. You remember when we drew it out a minute ago? We went from, on the x-axis, we went from 7 to 17 count by 1s. And on the y-axis, we went from 120 to 136 count by 2s. I could go to the window and I could just tell it that if I wanted to, okay? But there is this really cool button on my calculator in the zoom menu. 
Now, Zoom is where like all the preset windows are. We usually use a Zoom number six, the standard that is tens all the way around, but look at number nine. Number nine is Zoom stat. The cool thing about number nine is it'll take all that information you just put in list one and list two, and it will create the perfect window for you. So I'm gonna choose number nine, and look, there's my data. Now, I have this one funky little point down here. That doesn't look like what was on the graph. What does that mean? Yeah, I probably put it in wrong, okay? So that's an easy way, again, we're talking about ways to, to check yourself and to watch for errors and mistakes. So if I come down here and I look, okay, so we needed, we had a 19 in here instead of um, a 10. So now we fixed our list. All right, so now we're gonna go back to our graph. Now it looks like it's supposed to. That looks exactly like the one we had on our piece of paper, right? Okay, so if they tell me my equation is linear, I don't need to do any of that that we just did. The only reason I'm graphing this is just to see, is what is this? Is this a line? Is this a parabola? What is this? So if they tell me it's linear, I don't have to do any of that, okay? Now I can tell my calculator to create an equation to fit that information, all right? So I would put that information into list one and list two in statistics. And then in the statistics menu, if I go over one to calculate, there is all kinds of happiness in there. Now, remember we called this a regression? That's what this REG means in here when you've got like lin reg, quad reg, cube reg, quart, all of those are regressions. So if it looks like a parabola, I could do a quadratic reg. If it looks like a line, I could do a linear regression. Now, something that will make this a lot easier for you is if your stats wizard is on. So let's make sure it's on. So go to mode, if you would. Mode. And then down here at the bottom, see the stat wizard can be on or off. Make sure that your stat wizard is on because it will make life easier. All right, so statistics edit, we're going to choose number four, linear regression. So I'm gonna choose number four and it says, what do you want me to use for X? What you put in list one? Yes. What do you want me to use for Y? What you put in list two? Yes. All right, and then the rest of it I don't need. I'm just going to come down here and hit calculate. And that is how stinking fast your calculator can create an equation of a line to fit all of those points, like faster than we could do it to fit two points, right? So basically it's saying y equals ax plus b, put 1.5 in for a, and put 110 in for b. Now, Yours may not even have these R values down here on the bottom because I teach statistics. I have some extra things on my calculator. But I do want to point out to you that this R is 0.99. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But right up here, A is 1.5 and B is 110. All right, so if I went to Y equals and I put in that equation, 1.5X, and then plus 110. So let's see how the calculator did. If I go and graph that, hey, that looks pretty good, right? Right? So on the web assigned homework, there are two questions where they're gonna tell you it's a linear regression and they're gonna ask you to come up with the equation. So you're not gonna need to do all the extra stuff, all the extra graphing and all of that that we did since you know it's a linear regression. All you're gonna do is go to statistics, you're gonna choose edit, and you're gonna put your information in list one and list two. Then you're gonna go back to statistics and choose calculate and choose linear regression number four. And you're done. That's your answer, y equals 1.5x plus 110. Okay, now, as smart as this calculator is, 
you would think that it could type that equation in for me, right? I'm gonna go to y equals and I'm gonna clear my equation out. So there's nothing there, right? So when I go to statistics and I go over to calculate and I go down to number four, linear regression, this is entirely optional. But sometimes, let's say I'm doing a cubic. It's going to give me an A value, a B value, a C value, and a D value, and they might all have eight decimal places on them. I don't want to have to retype that, right? So here's something optional that you might be interested in. Right here, I can tell it, hey, store my regression equation in Y1. Type it for me, all right? The way that I get Y1 is I just do alpha trace. Alpha trace. So on your note sheet, you can see that's out in the margin. It's entirely optional. You don't have to do it that way. You don't have to include that at all. But watch this. Remember, I cleared out y equals, right? There was nothing in there. So now when I go to y equals, look at type the equation for me. Okay? So you can type it yourself. You can have the calculator type it for you. All right. So if we go back to that very first example that we did, all right, the very first example that we did, they had us create the equation. I just figured out how I can get my calculator to do that for me. But then they also had me plugging in values, right? Once I had that equation, they said, okay, now go back and figure out what the population would be in 2025, all right? So let's do the same thing here. Let's figure out what the population would be in 1986, all right? So that's six years after 1980. We're gonna say T is equal to six. So if we go, there's no reason at all why you couldn't plug six in by hand, all right? Your equation was y is equal to 1.5x plus 110. If you put six right there in the place of x, 1.5 times six is nine. Nine plus 110 is 119. I can do that without needing to use the calculator. But if I've already got all this in my calculator and it'll do it for me, all right? So I'm going to do second trace to get to the calculate menu. Now, we've used this before. This is where we found our maximum and minimum. This is also where we found our x-intercepts, our zeros. And we've used this little value button before. Remember for the value button, if I'm just going to choose the value button, I can tell it any value for x that I want, and it'll plug it in for me and give me the y value. So there's that same, when x is equal to 6, y equals 119. There's the same value that we got by plugging it in by hand. So your choice, plug it in by hand, let the calculator do it for you. All right, the next one says, how many would there be in um, 2010? All right, in 2010, T is equal to 30. If I come in here and I do that exact same thing we just did, and I ask it to tell me when X is equal to 30, what's Y? It's going to give me an error message. And the reason for that is it can only plug into what it can see. And 30 would be way off this graph, right? Like we only graphed this thing out to like 17, right? So 30 is way off the graph. So if I need to see more of the graph, I'm just going to zoom out. Just like you would do on your cell phone, you can zoom in and zoom out. Where do you think zoom out might be on your calculator? Zoom, yes. All right, so if we go to zoom, I'm just going to choose number three right there. I'm going to choose to zoom out. Um, nothing happened. Well, the reason is they're pausing so that this little blinking black cursor, if you want to move it, you can. You don't have to, but if you want to like move it to the center of your graph and say, hey, I want you to zoom out from right here, then when you hit enter the second time, it'll zoom out. So basically when you choose zoom in or zoom out, you have to hit enter twice for it to do it. All right, so now that it's zoomed out and it can see that 30, it wouldn't have any problem at all for me telling it, hey, go plug in 30, and then it can find the value, okay? So you might remember that when I did my regression that um, I got an R value, all right? That R value is something called a correlation. Now, the correlation is always going to be a number between negative 1 and positive 1. And I mention this to you because it often shows up on like the SAT or the PSAT or the ACT. And it's a pretty straightforward idea. Um, it's easy for us to address pretty quickly here today. All right. So 
a positive correlation just goes up and a negative correlation just goes down. So that makes sense, all right? The closer your correlation is to one, the stronger it is, all right? So like, you see this first one that we're saying is a strong positive? Obviously it's going up. Its correlation, its R value is 0.9. That means it's really, really close to being a direct correlation, a one-to-one -one correlation, a perfect straight line. So it's easy to remember a straight line looks like a, a one. So the closer it is to one, the closer it's gonna look like the straight line or whatever the graph might be, all right? If it's a little more scattered, look at this second one, this weak positive. If it, the points are a little more scattered, but you can still tell they're going up in an, in a semblance of a line, that would be a weak positive, and that would probably have a correlation of something like 0.5. This third one over here that says no correlation, if you just have a bunch of dots all over the page and you can't tell whether that's a line or not, doesn't look like there's any correlation to it at all, that value is gonna be closer to zero, all right? Similarly, if they're going down, so you can see like this strong negative, that would probably be a correlation of like a negative 0.9. And then the weak negative still going down, but a little more scattered, that would probably be like a negative 0.5. So on the um, standardized testing, sometimes they'll give you a graph and ask you what kind of a correlation that represents, or they'll give you several different values to choose from for R that might fit that. And so that would be the idea for that. All right.